Hey everyone, good afternoon. It's Susan Coffin here for Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast. We are in the midst of a really interesting series of talks about school and getting success at school. And today we are talking with Cindy Goldrich about parent-teacher cooperation specifically. Um, topics such as how parents can help teachers understand their children academically, socially, emotionally, how to foster parent-teacher homework, sorry, teamwork, um, how to help your teacher put in place ADD-friendly school strategies for the classroom, um, the best way to have productive parent-teacher meetings, and a lot more. So we're so pleased today to have Cindy Goldrich with us. Um, she is a mental health counselor and a coach and the author of um, Eight Keys for Parenting Children with ADHD, a terrific book recognized by, by everyone for, as providing parents, educators, and therapists with lots of easy tips for addressing challenging kids. She developed a workshop series called Calm and Connected Parenting Children with ADHD. Um, and through her site, PTS Coaching, which you can visit online, ptscoaching.com, she conducts professional development nationwide for teachers, professionals, and trains professionals to become ADHD parents coaches. So all you professionals and teachers out there, take a look at ptscoaching.com. Cindy, thank you so much for being here today. We are very grateful for your oh, time. I look forward to your absolutely. presentation. Absolutely. You guys do such a great job, and I'm so proud to be here again. Thank you for thank having you me. Thank you so much. Um, I want to mention um, our sponsor today. We're so grateful to our sponsors. This one, this broadcast is supported by Esteem Therapeutics. Esteem Therapeutics has automated the really complex process of managing your child's ADH condition with a, a an incredible dashboard filled with great resources. Um, if you can incorporate Esteem Thrive in your back to school strategy, you will find your life will your you and your child's life will be much smoother. You can sign up for a free trial, no credit card needed, at chooseesteem.com. So C H O O S E esteem.com. Please give Steam Therapeutics a look. Um, before Sydney starts speaking, we want to ask our listeners to tell us a little bit about how you establish parent teacher communications. What's your strategy? Um, we're going to put a poll up. Do you um, count on face to face meetings before school starts? Uh, do you contact your teacher via phone or email? Um, do you wait for the parent teacher conference? Other, check other if, you know, maybe it's all of the above. Um, while you're taking the poll, let me just mention a few key points about this new broadcast platform. I think everyone's getting used to it now. We're really loving it. Um, the widgets are resizable and movable. You can move them around the screen and span your slide area um, so you can get the most out of it. You can submit your, you'll be submitting your questions through the Q&A widget. Cindy will be taking questions after she finishes her presentation. Um, you can download the slides right now through the Resource Center. And probably most important, this webinar is streamed through your computer and there's no dial-in number. So uh, webinars are really bandwidth intensive. It's really important that you close out any programs or browser sessions that might be running in the background. If your network is slow, the slides may lag. Um, okay, so let's see the school, the um, poll results and see. Um, oh, interesting. So most of you are contacting your teachers via phone or email, not face-to-face. Um, I can understand that in today's world. Um, we'll look forward to hearing more from you about how those communications work. And with that, let me turn it over to Cindy to start her presentation. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Susan. And that actually is a very interesting result. I'm going to talk about that result a little bit as we as we go on. So I'm I'm really grateful for that poll question. I want to start by just saying let's all breathe, because <laughs> I know at this point in the year. Um, those of you listening to this live, it's, it's September, so some of your kids have been in school for just a few weeks. Some of you have been in school for over a month. It starts to heat up. So the first thing is finding balance. Parents really need to be able to know how to support and advocate for their child, but at the same time understand what's going on and build that new relationship with a new teacher, sometimes even in a new school setting. So being able to speak to your teacher and support your child is not an easy feat, and we're going to break that down step by step and see what that can look like. 
But at the same time, the other side of that balance is that the teacher needs to help the student learn, but it's not, you know, they have more than one child, obviously. So they do need that child to be able to work within the framework of that classroom, which requires, of course, a certain number of rules and policies, and also the expectations of the, of the teacher for that new school year. And then we have to include the child. I always say, you know, we must, must, must include the child's perspective, especially as they're getting older, but even while they're in elementary school, they have a voice, and when they don't feel that that voice is being heard, that's when they start to either go underground, meaning that they start to shut down and shut out and end up in the nurse's office or whatever else, or they start to push back. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, refusing to go or acting out in school or acting out on the way to school. So we really want to help that child feel positive about going to school and know what, you know, what the expectations are of them. A few of the basic facts to consider that I like to talk about is the first thing is that ADHD really shows up differently in different settings. I always say this when I, when I do my parent trainings and also when I do the teacher trainings. You know, for example, um, Johnny's parent calls the, the meeting with the teacher and says, hey, I'm really having a hard time with Johnny. These are the things that are going on at home, and I'm sure you're seeing them at school. And the teacher says, no, actually, I'm really not seeing that at school. Things at school are going fine. And, of course, the parent begins to wonder, or the teacher, you know, the parent may feel judged, like, oh, this teacher probably feels like, I don't know what to do with my kid at home. But the opposite also happens, where the teacher calls the meeting and is struggling a lot with the child on certain aspects, whether it's behavior or getting them to do certain work. And the parent says, well, you know, at home, these things go smoothly. And of course, the assumption may be, well, the teacher doesn't know how to teach the child. The fact is, the kids do show up differently in these different settings, and sometimes very differently. And I want to talk about some of those differences. First of all, the time of day. If the child is, let's say, not much of a morning person and they're going into school and the only experience the teacher has, you know, maybe it's middle school or high school and this child is just sort of lethargic and not really attuned to what's going on, you might see that same child later in the day really much more animated. So that's an important thing to consider. Also, um, the expectations. In each subject and in each class, there may be different expectations. If the child's in elementary school, then obviously the teacher for the most part is the same, but there might be the specials like gym and art and music. But even within the classroom, if the subject matter is different, and this kind of ties into that next issue of student interest level, if the subject matter is different, then the child may show up differently. It can raise a lot of anxiety or, or concern or lack of confidence as the child switches from doing math, for instance, and doing a writing exercise. So that same child may show up differently in these different types of situations. And then, of course, the relationship with the teacher. And I'm going to keep coming back to this, you know, this entire time that student's relationship with the teacher is vital. If they have a strong, easy relationship, they're going to show up differently than with another teacher where they maybe don't have that same kind of relationship. We'll talk about that in more detail later on. But then we have medication. If the medication is such that it's impacting the child, for instance, how they are um, able to pay attention during the day or how they are um, feeling emotionally. Some of the kids, when I, when I work with the parents, we know that some kids feel much better when they're on meds. They feel like they can focus, they can, you know, they're socially more comfortable, but some of the kids feel a lot more dull. So they're gonna show up differently. We need to take, in, take that into consideration. And finally, the level of structure. You know, I know the classic information that you may have heard about ADHD as well. You need a lot of structure. The fact of the matter is, I always say parent the child you have. 
structure for one child is not the same need or, or benefit as structure for another. We need to see what is the structure that that child needs. And again, that ties back into including the child in this conversation. So these are all, I want you to keep these kind of in the background when you think about the relationship that you are going to have with that teacher and the information you're going to want to be communicating with the teacher and the things that are going to be valuable for you to know. But the other things to consider are the physical environment in the classroom itself. You know, fidgeting I know is, is such a big issue and fortunately today in a lot of settings it's a lot more understood, although I can tell you, you know, as I do more teacher trainings across the country, I still find there are a lot of settings where teachers do feel that kids need to be sitting still in order to learn. The reality is sitting still for some of these kids actually deactivates them. It makes it so much harder for them to pay attention. They need to move. Some of them just need to move on a small basis. Maybe it's fiddling with, you know, an object in their hands. Some of them may need to move more, more physically. Maybe they need some kind of flexible seating. One of the things about flexible seating, and I'll just explain what I mean by that for those of you who are not aware, flexible seating has been used now as the terminology for any seats that are not just your straight seat. So it could be um, one of those large exercise ball chairs that has um, a base to it, so you can use it as a seat. Or it could be a wobble chair. Or it could be a standing desk so that the student can actually stand and move their feet around a little bit. There are um, bands you could put around the base of a chair so that the student can move their feet a little bit without distracting too many people. There are many ways that a student can move around. The important thing, and I wrote an article about this that went viral, is we must teach the skill and the tool of fidgeting. So fidgeting needs to be something that the student is doing that's kind of in the background. It's their secondary focus and not their primary focus. And they can't be distracting others and they can't be destructive to whatever the materials are. But these important factors of physical environment can make all the difference in the world for some of these kids to be able to pay attention. Where they sit can really matter. I know that in the IEPs and the 504s very, very often there's the combination of preferential seating, but I always say to me, you know, usually that means sitting up front with the teacher. To me that seat's very often the kiss of death because that kid's going to spend their time turning around and looking and seeing what's going on behind them. Right? So I always prefer let's talk to the student about where they think they should see, sit and keep in mind that our goal here is to raise their own awareness about what do they need to do to pay attention in class. So if Johnny says, well, I think the best place I should sit is the back of the room or with all my friends, then I might say, okay, well, that's fine. Let's talk about how we're going to know that's working. And then Johnny, of course, has to be able to express, well, I'm going to be able to pay attention in class. I'll be able to answer the teacher's questions. I won't be distracting others, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going to see if that seat really works for him. Because I want Johnny to be able to know how he needs to function in the world. Our goal, both as parents and educators, is to help kids develop their self-regulation skills. So we want Johnny to know that when he goes off, whether it's college or the workplace, we want him to know, well, where is the best place for me to position myself so that I am really paying attention and participating as I need to. So the fidgeting and the movement are very important. The breaks. Sometimes kids really need a break, and it may not be when the teacher is planning a break, but we need to consider that as well. A break doesn't have to be, hey, go take five minutes and come back, you know, when you're ready. A break can simply mean changing the learning activity. So that can mean, okay, now why don't you go stand up while you're doing this same activity. That actually could be a break. Breaks actually boost the chemicals in the brain that are needed to construct memory. So these breaks become vital and the more we can help the teacher understand our child's nuances and help our child read their own signals about when are they needing some kind of a change rather than, again, just shutting down or acting out, 
we're going to help this child advocate for themselves. And going right along with that is each child, if they do tend to have a lot of breakdowns and a lot of emotional, you know, challenges, they need a safe place and they need a safe person. There's a lot we can talk about with that. If people have questions as we get to the q and I'm happy to talk about that. But the child needs to feel like if they are, for whatever reason, not able to sit in that physical space and they know that they've reached their melting point, there needs to be a pre-planned way that this child can handle themselves so that it's not always in the negative, punitive way. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is the emotional, the emotional manners. And as I started to say, that the kid needs to feel safe. One of the things we know is that if a child doesn't feel safe, there's, I want you to all kind of make a, a circle with your hands. And I want you to think of that as the cognitive space your child has to do, let's say, a math problem. If they are feeling stress or they are feeling anxious, or they are just feeling lack of confidence. I want you to take your hands and I want you to make that circle smaller and smaller and smaller. And that becomes the space that that child has to do that problem. So if that child is not feeling safe in that moment, they're not able to attend. And that again goes back to why this is so important that the child can feel comfortable being who they are. And of course, going along right with that is the student must feel connected to the teacher. You know, I was doing a, um, a training this summer at a prestigious private school, and we were talking about what do you do when a kid has a total meltdown? How do you help the kid, but how do you as the teacher manage the whole classroom at the same time? And the teacher said, should I, you know, the kid's under the table and he's just really having a hard time. And, you know, it's, it seems like he's getting agitated and I have to think about the other students in the class and who should I pay attention to? What should I do? Should I get those kids out of the class or should I pay attention to this kid or what should I do? And I said, first we have to talk about what your relationship is with that child. And then another teacher raised their hand and said, well, why wouldn't the kid trust the teacher as the teacher goes to approach the child? And many of the other teachers in the room sort of you could see they sort of gasped or moved around, and I asked the question, how many of you, and I'm going to ask this to you out there, how many of you have had a teacher in your life who, for whatever the reason, you did not feel safe and comfortable being yourself? So that's a very important thing to consider. One of the things we talked about is that if the child has that relationship with that teacher, then maybe as that teacher goes under that table and approaches the child, the child can start to feel comforted. But if that teacher, if that student does not feel that way, then that may agitate the situation further. So, but the other thing is that the student has to feel that they can be who they are. And I always talk about that the students cannot feel like square pegs in round holes. They must be able to know themselves enough and if they need to fidget, if they need to move, you know, advocacy is a developmental skill. It can't be an expectation. Just because a child's in sixth grade doesn't mean that they feel comfortable going up to this new teacher and saying, hey, you know what, I do better when I sit over here, or I do better when I, you know, whatever that is. So we want to help that student know how to advocate for themselves. Which brings us back to you parents. You have to know your child. I would recommend that through the years you keep a basic log, literally for each year your child's in school. One of the things you can do is have a page that talks about what are some of the things that triggers your child? What are some of the predictable challenges? You know, a lot of times when I work with parents, they say, oh, my kid always, or oh, my kid never. Well, I say, well, that's great. That shows me there's a pattern of behavior. Now we can be detectives. Now we can figure out what triggers these things and what are some of the predictable things that we can now plan some problems around, you know, some solutions around? For instance, how does your kid respond when the teacher says, okay, we're going to do a project? Some kids are really excited about that. 
some kids imagine all the artwork they're going to get to do or the building they're going to get to do, right? The creativity that they're going to get to express. But for some kids, they think about, oh, my God, I'm going to have to work with other kids. I'm not so good in a group. I get lost in a group. Who am I going to be with? Who's going to want to be with me? We want to really make sure we know our kid and how they're going to react to these situations. Because um, some of these situations, they are going to feel more confident, less confident, more comfortable, less confident, uh, less comfortable. And then we want to write down, you know, you've had, by the time your kids are in, let's say, fifth grade, you've had a few years of experience with different teachers in different settings. What's worked well in the past? What has the teacher done that has really helped your child, right? Um, maybe the teacher let your child be the, be the one that um, always got to stand up and hand out the papers or was the one that brought the log down to the office so that they had that built-in break. I want you to think about what really worked well. And also, who in the school has your child connected with? If your child's in fifth grade and your child had a wonderful relationship with that third grade teacher, remember I was talking about that the child needs to have a safe place? That might be something to consider. If your child needs a safe person or a safe place to go to, somehow collaborating with that third grade teacher. So this, of course, brings us to what's your child's perspective. What are your child's concerns? It's a great thing to talk to your child about, not you know, while well, there's a meltdown or anything, but at a, you know, maybe on a Sunday afternoon if you're going for a nice walk or something, just what are your kids' concerns about school? What are the things that make them, you know, a little more hesitant, a little more nervous? And what does he believe he needs in order to succeed? Kids will tell you a whole lot if you have that relationship with them. And, of course, if you do have a child who you aren't, you know, connecting with in that way, please, of course, reach out for support. That's, that's one of the things we as parent coaches really do is help you build back that communication skill. But you want your child to be able to say, you know what, when, when Mrs. Sally used to do this for me, I felt really good. Or when I have, you know, all of my materials right near me or when I know what to expect with the transition times are, that makes me feel comfortable. That's when I can succeed. So again, we want to hear what are some of the strategies that the teacher had mentioned. Now, in terms of your teacher's perspective, how well does the teacher know your child? One of the things I strongly recommend, and it's definitely not too late, in fact, it's never too late if you're having problems. I know, and this is where I'm going to go back to that survey, Sue, that you did at the beginning, where how do you establish that parent-teacher communication? I noticed that a lot of you said, in fact, 50% said that you use phone or email. I would suggest something a little bit different at the beginning. I would strongly recommend, and I have some really great worksheets for this. If you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to send these to you. I would recommend that you give your teacher a one-page basic profile of your child, of their strengths, of their challenges, of the triggers, a lot of these things we've already been talking about so that this teacher can really glance down and see some of these things. They have it to go back to because you might find two months from now that that teacher might want to pull that out or if that teacher is going to have a substitute. It's a great thing. Um, I know that my daughter who's a, a teacher, she keeps these in a folder and that way when she has a resource uh, a substitute teacher, that teacher knows, okay, I can just glance over and see are there any main points I need to know about each of these kids. So have something that you communicate with that teacher in a very functional, specific way. Um, ask the teacher. When you've had a student like mine, because I'm sure my child is unique, every child is unique, but I'm sure you've had some children who have some overlapping characteristics, what are some things you've done in the past? so that I can be prepared so I can think about this and maybe talk to my child offline and see if maybe these are some suggestions that my child would be open to. And along those lines is what are the teachers asked? You know, teachers have a lot of experience and very often they may want to suggest to you something that at the surface you may feel like, I don't know, I don't know if I want to do that with my child, but maybe you need to give a little and, and trust the teacher and, and try some of the things their way a little bit. 
So what are the expectations your child wants, uh, your teacher wants your child to meet that maybe will stretch your child a little bit, but maybe you can work out? And then I always like to talk about the issue of what is enabling versus supporting, and I'm going to tell you the best way I know how to explain it. Um, you go in to the laundry room or, you know, you're down in the basement and you see, oh, my God, there's my kid's violin. He forgot it again, third time this month. I don't know what to do. And, of course, many of the parents go ahead and they bring it in and the teacher looks and says, oh, my God. I can't believe this teacher is bringing in this violin and again. When is this parent going to learn? This parent just enables the child. And when is this kid going to learn? And, you know, the parent is all embarrassed. But let's see what went on at home. See, Johnny's a good kid. Johnny wants to do well. And Johnny knows that the rules are you've got to do your homework first, and then you can practice the violin. So, Johnny finally finishes his work, and we know with some of these kids, oh, my goodness, homework takes them forever, right? So it's getting really late. So he goes downstairs. He doesn't want to disturb everyone else in the family. He starts practicing his violin. And then the parent calls and says, come on, Johnny, time to go up. You've got to take a shower. You've got to get ready for bed. So Johnny says, all right. And, you know, he says, all right, I'll, I'll put this away later. And the parent says, all right, you'll pack up later. And Johnny goes up. Nighttime ends. Morning comes. Parent goes down and sees the violin. Oh, my goodness. I forgot to remind Johnny. And Johnny forgot to do it. And Johnny's really got to get better at this. But, oh, my goodness, you know what? He made the bus today. I'm so proud of him. And his shoes matched. And, okay, you know, his room is a disaster, and he did get in a fight with his sister, but he ate some breakfast. I'm really proud of him. And I don't want him to get in trouble at school about forgetting his violin and, I don't want him to fall behind and all of that, so maybe I'm going to bring in this violin in again. So the, t the parent packs it up and he brings it in. And what do I suggest teachers say? I always tell teachers, you know what? Say to the parent, I see you're bringing that violin in again. Is there anything I can do to help you? Because what the parent needs is support. So what's my definition about enabling versus supporting? See, mom, mom has a whole list of things that she's working on with Johnny. I've got to make sure he cleans up his room better. I've got to help him do his homework, you know, in a more timely fashion. I've got to help him remember to bring that file in. All these different things. She has a whole list. My definition of enabling is doing something for someone else without a plan to help them do it for themselves. I'm going to say that again because I know some of you may be writing that down. So listen to me. Let me say it, and then I'm going to say it a third time so you can write it. Enabling is doing something for someone else without a plan to help them do it for themselves. Mom has a plan. Her plan is I'm adding it to that list, but I've got to get to these other things first. So enabling is doing something for someone else without a plan to help them do it for themselves. Very important distinction. So before we conclude, I want to talk about that meeting because I know that you know, about 14% of you said you like to have a face-to-face -face meeting. We need to see what does that look like at various points during the year, right? First of all, if possible, I always recommend you bring someone with you. It doesn't have to be a paid advocate or an attorney. It could be a sister. It could be a friend. It could be someone who's not as emotionally invested with you. Why? Well, remember when I told you make a circle with your hands about your brain? And I talked about the stress and how that really reduces the space. The other thing it does is it shuts down our ability to hear. So when you're in a stressful situation, and by and large these meetings do tend to be stressful, you're going to want to have someone with you who can help take notes or help remind you of the important things you want to say or maybe help slow down the meeting so that, you know, they can repeat the question that, you know, you were asking or that the, someone in the room was asking so that you have a chance to slow down and hear. I also recommend that you have your sh thoughts and concerns written on a nice organized piece of paper with some main bullet points, the priority of what are the things you want to get across, what are the questions, what are the concerns, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, try. I know it's not easy when this gets stressful, but try to really hear what's being said. 
I know our knee-jerk reaction is very often to think about, well, what do I need to say when they say this? But that's where I say you've got to slow down the meeting. So that's where you may actually need to say, wait, I want to write down that sentence you're saying because I need to think about it. You don't have to feel pressured. You don't have to feel rushed. If this meeting is not going well or it's taking long, then you may say, you know what, we're going to need to have a second meeting. You do what you need to do to be able to really hear. And also, be willing to brainstorm a range of solutions. You may have your perspective. You may have your preconceived notion of what you think should be done, and it may not agree with what they're saying, and the same thing on the other side. So be willing to say, okay, let's write down these ideas, and let's keep thinking if there are other things we can do. And then finally, if at all possible, I really recommend you include the child. Now, I know that sometimes it's a lot for the kids to hear, so you may want to have a meeting before the meeting, right? I always say there's a lot of behind-the-scenes parenting that goes on. But it can be very valuable and very empowering for the child to be there, to let them know that their voice really will be heard, really will be mattered, and that it matters to the adults in the room that the child be receptive and understand some of the things that we're recommending. That way, if they're not understanding them or have their disagreements, we're giving them that opportunity. And if at the end of the day you've had this meeting and there has been no progress, there's, there's a few things I want you to do. First of all, acknowledge it. Be open and express that, you know what, guys? We are all coming here with the best of intentions and we're not able to agree. Let's agree to disagree and talk about what's going to happen next. And also, if things are contentious with that teacher, then say, you know what? I think we need to bring someone else in here. Who else can we bring in so that we can work out this situation rather than beating your heads against the wall? And acknowledge, you know, this is hard. This is not, you know, you and I might be really disagreeing about what's going on, but this isn't personal. I respect you and your position. Guys, these teachers work really, really hard. And they, we may not always agree with what they're doing and their perspectives, but that doesn't discount their professionalism. So we need to really respect that and acknowledge it. And then before you leave there, always agree on what is the next step. End on a positive note. And finally, I don't have this written there, but the last thing I always recommend is write some summary notes for yourself and send that off to the committee whether it's just the teacher or the group of people, send that off so that if there's any disagreement in terms of what was discussed, whether it's the open things we need to keep working on or the agreements that were made, then it can be acknowledged right away. Okay? Um, at this point, I think I'm going to turn this over you, to you, Sue. I know there are probably a bunch of questions. I'm happy to Thank take you. them. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, please post your questions at this point for Cindy to uh, to address. Um, so let's see. We have some interesting questions now. Um, can you talk some more about the strengths and weakness handout, Cindy, that um, you would recommend developing for your child? Sure. And if anyone would like to have that handout, I'm happy to send it to you. Just email me at info at ptscoaching.com, but I'll Great. explain it. Um, okay. For the younger kids, it really just looks like a bunch of um, like rectangles, so that's nice, easy layout where it says my child's strengths, my child's interests, my child's challenges, strategies that have worked, the best way to communicate with me, you know, the time of day, whether it's email or phone, you know, how to reach out to me. I think there's one or two, in fact, I know there's one or two other things on there, but just so that the parent, the, the teacher can really have something that they can glance at. For the older students, it may be more of a list with bullet points, um, and I have that. And I also have um, a letter that you may want to write at any point during the year, whether it's, um, you know, right before Thanksgiving or the winter recess or something, where you're feeling like you want to reset. You're feeling like you want to 
kind of say, okay, this is what's going on, this is where we're stuck, these are the things we need, some nice bulleted issues. Okay. Um, Cindy, a number of people didn't, didn't grasp your email address. Um, can you repeat that again? Sure. Info, I-N-F-O, at P-T-S. That's my website. stands for Pathways to Success. PTScoaching.com. And by the way, parents, the reason my business is called PTS Coaching is because I think many kids have many different pathways. Their path is not going to look straight. It's going to be all over the place, and some of them, their path is going to take them a little longer than you would anticipate. But don't lose hope and don't, don't get too stressed about that. These are great kids. You know, I'm sure there are many webinars you've heard. I know I've done some on executive function skills where we really acknowledge that sometimes these kids just take a little longer to develop some of these skills. Um, great. So let's see. I've got some great, some great questions. So, though here's um, Isabel, whose child is in high school. Um, I understand that I used to meet with every teacher, but now my child's in high school. How should I handle? Should I try to meet with all his teachers, or should I? Is this the time to to allow him to learn to 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 address the teachers himself? That's a really great question. Um, I'm going to always go back to parent the child you have, which is my way of saying it really depends on your child. If you have a child who um, really is, you know, very good at advocating for themselves and really wants to be taking that role, then you may empower them to, you know, talk about, talk with your child about which of the teachers you feel comfortable advocating with. What are the things you want your teachers to know? Are you, you know, how can you communicate those things? Because especially if they're in high school, if they're going to be going on to college, they're going to have to advocate with their professors. So you do want them to start having that experience of advocating for themselves. But we don't want them to be at a loss if they're not ready. So that's where we may want to really be able to step in. And that transitional period of having the student in the meeting with the teacher and you, and you can prep your child and say, hey, you know what, kiddo? I want you to take a bigger role. You want to take a bigger role. The teachers are used to me being there. I'm used to being there. I'll take the back seat, but I'll be there if you need me. So maybe you can have them, you mm -hmm. know, have those meetings together. That makes right? sense. Um, one yep. more thing, too, I just want to say, say about that, the idea of meeting with every teacher versus a team. Sometimes it's nice if you can meet with a few of the teachers together because they collectively may have a a very different picture of your student than individually. So if one of the teachers hears this about this student who, wow, he participates, he's great, and he's really animated, and the other teacher, their only experience is, wow, he's shut down and he doesn't participate because you know that's the, you know, your child's weakest class, it's nice for them to sometimes hear each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that makes sense. If you can get them together, yeah, that would be great. Um, Boy, there's some tough questions here. Oh, here's one. So my son's teachers believe that he's intentionally misbehaving and that he needs to be, quote, held responsible. They're frustrated and have no more patience. Um, what should this parent do, Cindy? That sounds tough. Oh, that is so tough, and I, and I really empathize with that. Um, I wish I knew what, what grade, um, mm -hmm. not that it would matter that much, but there, there are nuances, so please feel free to reach out to me. But um, if you're feeling like the teacher just is looking at your child and saying they're not under that, you know, it's willful disrespect. Is that kind of what you're saying in that question, Sue? Yeah. That they're yeah. willfully just, okay. Um, first of all, how much does this teacher really understand about ADHD? And again, this is not to put down teachers. I do a lot of teacher training, teaching very close to my heart, but the reality is it's not in their original knowledge and not every school has invested the time and energy and money in, you know, helping the, the teachers understand. I always say that the teacher training that I do, the first hour or so is almost sensitivity training. I help these teachers really understand this is not willful disrespect. This is not, this is part of who they are. But what can you as a parent do? You can look through some of the amazing articles on attitude and some of the webinars. You can look at my website on a few basic fact sheets and 
try to present those to the teacher. You know, October is ADHD Awareness Month. There's lots of reason that you could say, hey, just found these, you know, these articles. Um, but I would have a meeting with the teacher where you express some of the things you've noticed about your child and allow them to be curious with you. Like, you can even share something, for instance, let's say processing speed. Very often these kids have a slower processing speed, so they look like they're not paying attention. They look like they're not being involved, right? You may say, hey, you know what? I noticed that when I would go faster with my child and he would just, you know, he would melt down, he would yell at me and everything else, but when I realized that he really just wasn't hearing everything I was saying at the pace I was saying it and it slowed down, it really shifted our conversation. It shifted our relationship. I wonder if you can tell me, teacher, what are some of the situations where you're finding that my child seems like they're being difficult or defiant or shut down? And, of course, if the teacher says, well, all the time, then you're going to want to kind of drill down a little bit. Okay, we need more information, and that's where we can really work closely. Okay, the, yeah. I will say that um, we do have some great handouts, uh, teacher handouts, some by Chris Dendy, um, that are really made for turning in to giving out at school, and they're really terrific. So on the Attitude website, yeah. go on, go to the advocacy um, section and you'll find just some great downloadable handouts. And I know Cindy's site has them as well. It's really important to educate the teachers, no question. Um, it, is, it is vital. And always keep in mind, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Sue, but always no. keep in mind that teachers are people. And right. some of them have had children who have had challenges, and some of them had those children that could have parented themselves. And I have seen both sides, and I've seen the real shifts. It's not that they don't want to. It's that they need a little extra support. So, All right. yeah, go ahead, um, So we have three or four questions here that are more or less around one topic. Um, some people put it differently, and that is how often, how do I actually ask the teacher for an update? without appearing to be annoying or that helicopter parent or to be bugging mm -hmm. the teacher. So one person says, is it feasible for me to ask for a weekly update? I don't want to burn out the teachers. And another person says, it's been a month. I'd love to ask for an update. I don't want to seem overbearing. I don't want to be the parent of that kid. So, I mean, there's a real hesitance on the part of parents. And I think for obvious reasons, knowing how overworked mm -hmm. many teachers mm -hmm. are to know how to go about um, asking for, for, for feedback and how often and how to do that. Right, and that's, and that's a great question and a very big topic. One of the things I always recommend is talk to the teacher about um, what do they think would be a reasonable amount of, of space because some of them have, you know, definitely have their ways. You can talk about um, if I have certain topics that are very timely now that I'm making some shifts, because maybe you're making a shift in medication, or maybe you've just brought on a new tutor, or maybe you've, um, you know, maybe there's a subject that they're really struggling with, so this is a high intensity time where you're needing more support. You can set that up with the teacher and say, hey, listen, I don't want you to feel like I'm gonna be reaching out to you every week all year long, but these are the things that are going on, so I'm needing a little bit extra support. Would that be okay? What will be the best way to reach out with you? Um, maybe, again, you can make that simple chart, um, and I certainly can help them do this, make that simple chart with a few um, questions so that the teacher, you know, making it very easy for that teacher to just, you know, give you a scale or give you, you know, the feedback that you're needing. Um, um, you know, there's also that great, yeah. those great daily report card um, and, and weekly report yep. card structures where the teacher can just check off. So one person here, Lucinda says, I met with my son's fourth, fifth grade teacher at the start of the year to discuss ADHD. And, and since then, the teacher has been using a check system, check marks when my son does well or not well and sending that back to me. So um, there are mm -hmm. some feedback forms that might be useful that don't require the teacher to do a huge amount right. of work. Right. Exactly, and, and the reason I suggest making your own is because, again, your concerns may shift as the weeks go on. Maybe you'd rather ask, you know, just about certain behaviors or just about certain um, concepts. Is he getting those or organizational things so that you're shifting the focus 
on where you're needing it and being receptive to what the teacher is needing as well. Mm -hmm. So right. that collaborative approach on, on what do you want them to be. Right. Um, here's an interesting question about homework. Um, this, this writer feels that her child is, is just not able to do this much homework. He's doing hours every night and hours on the weekend and still not finishing it. Um, how should she handle that with her, with the school? Okay. Oh, that big homework issue. And again, I don't know I what know. grade we're talking about, so that's, that's hard. I would encourage, you know, when parents write their questions, if you can, but let's be generic with that to the best that we can. You must speak with the teacher about what is the expectation about how much time my child should be spending on homework. Teachers sometimes are unaware of how long your child is actually spending. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I would keep a log of how long your child is spending on each subject independently. And next to that, how much time are you spending with your child? Um, there's a whole, oh gosh, there's so much I want to say, and this is so much, I, I have a whole homework workshop thing, because what I'm thinking is it also depends on um, the level of help you're giving, and are you giving the appropriate level of help? Does the teacher know how much help you're giving? But if we're talking about the raw amount of homework, sometimes we want to modify that homework, right, to reduce the load. You know, when we're dealing with the upper grades, that sometimes is harder to modify. How do you modify if the homework is to write an essay, you know, reflective essay, right? They can't just write one paragraph. So we need to see what is the homework, why is the homework taking so long? Is that a reasonable expectation? Or maybe it's something, you know, really generated from your child. Maybe your child's meds have worn off and it's not reasonable to keep doing it. Maybe your child, you know, needs, some, needs a break. Maybe they need more support in the work. So there's lots of different variables before we go to the teacher and say we need to reduce the amount of work. We're going to need to give the teacher more information on what's happening at home and what so our concerns are. So keeping that log so you can really show um, what's happening sounds like a, a helpful yeah. suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, and I actually have, um, I'm sorry, I was just going to say I actually have uh, a homework kind of agenda sheet that I like that talks about, um, you know, writing down how long should each of these assignments take so that the mm -hmm. kids can start measure that against what's reasonable. Okay. Um, the school counselor who's listening, Terry, says, how do I encourage parents to share with their children that, the, that they have ADHD? And I think that's an interesting question because other parents have said, um, my child feels the stigma and doesn't want to discuss ADHD. So, I guess the topic is between parents, teachers, and the child. How do you how do you mm -hmm. talk about having ADHD? How, what's the best way to, to address that? First of all, thank you, school counselor, for taking the time to sit in on this as well. I always think it's so important to have both sides of this conversation. Um, so I really value that. In terms of answering, though, for the counselor, um, my recommendation is this. When you say to a parent, oh, you know, Johnny has a hard time sitting still, or Johnny, you know, is, is, doesn't raise his hand, or Johnny's not doing his work as, as he should, understand that the parent only knows that child in the context of that family. That child may be doing so much better than their other children that they say, oh, you know, he's doing fine, that's a big deal. Or that child, you know, the other children may be, you know, these, these very easygoing, good students, and the child, you know, for this parent, that's so out of whack. So they're used to that. I always tell the, the counselors and the teachers, speak in terms of the developmental norms. By third grade, this is what we notice about most children. This is what I'm noticing about your child. This is what they're doing. So that you're, you're able to get that. You also want to have the observation of multiple teachers whether if it's an elementary school, you still want to have the observation of the gym teacher, the art teacher, you know, the various different settings so that you can give the parent the range of, of observations that you've had. Mm -hmm. I hope that, okay. that answered some of that. Right. Um, there are a couple of questions about how to handle children who have really big meltdowns in class. 
um, emotional uh, outbursts or discipline. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. not sure what they're looking, what the, the questioners are looking for, but I guess the feedback from school is, is their child is having real behavior and meltdowns. How should they handle that? Right. Right. And that, this goes to what I was talking about at the very beginning about helping the kid feel safe. If you have a child who has meltdown, so it's very important to have a pre-planned escape venue. Now, escape could be within the classroom, right? Maybe it's just a quiet corner in the classroom where, um, you know, and, and it could be for all kids that need it, but obviously this kid may use it more often. If we're in that corner. You've got um, maybe some favorite fidget toys, maybe some drawing they can color or or um, putting on a headset to just kind of drown out the outside noise or, you know, whatever it is. They should have a pre-planned kind of a list of things I could do to calm down. Maybe it's a place they're going to go and they could do some deep breathing or some of the things that have been discussed in advance that will help that child. Mm-hmm. If the child would do better by walking out of the classroom, there needs to be a plan on where is this child going, how are we knowing that that child is getting there safely, how do we know, you know, do we need someone from an office to come pick that child up, is there someone, you know, is there an aide in the class that can bring this child to that place, but it needs to be done in such a way that the child does not feel punished or ostracized or kicked out. I know everyone cares and wants to, you know, do the right thing, but there's language we can use with that child in advance so that kid knows, hey, we're helping you, we're, we're going to, you know, you know that this is where you're going. So it needs to be planned out in advance, very important. And one of the things um, that you can do is really, I'm not big on reward and, and, and punishment programs, believe me. I, a lot of the behavior mod programs, you know, I, I think need, some overhauls, but one of the things you can do is if you have a child who has a meltdown and you can help them start to recognize before they're actually melting down so that they they give the signal to the teacher, hey, I need to, you know, go out, whether it's for a glass of water so I can come back or go to that separate space. If they start to use that, then you can acknowledge that with a, a small reward, just acknowledging the fact that, hey, you took care of yourself in a positive way. That's great. Right? Okay. And so. Okay, great. Um, a teacher here um, asking, how can I make, this is a wonderful question, how can I make sure a student feels safe with me? Are there any specific things I can do to make sure I have a strong connection with my student? Absolutely. I love that question. Thank you for that. Um, number one, eye contact. Number two, use the child's name. People feel so valued when we use their name. Number three, if there's a cultural difference or even just a difference because you guys are just very different people, ask the kid, and it could be whether it's a homework assignment or I always suggest do this in the whole classroom, could you write down, you know, ten things that you wish I knew about you, right, whether it's some of your interests or some of your, you know, things you're proud of or whatever else something so that you have a beginning of a relationship with that child that you have some things you can connect on, right? Ask them, you know, whether it's their favorite sport team, if they're an athletic kid or, you know, music or art or just some of the things, just those casual conversations. And remember, especially at the beginning of the year, don't worry if the kid is not making the academic advancements. Much more important that they feel safe with you. Because, again, we want to keep that brain, that, that big space, really open, right? So if they feel connected with you, they're going to start to trust and take the risks that they need to take. Because very often these kids feel like they're sitting in the mud. They're so mm-hmm. nervous. They're so distraught, right? So thank you for that question. Um, yeah, great answer, too. Um, Rachel says, how do I his- handle it when my son has been disciplined at school due to his ADHD behavior? Okay. Well, again, we're going to need to get more specific and we're going to need to get proactive. We need to see what's the true violation of if there's an IEP or a 504, what are the school policies, but even more than that, what are we going to do to teach this kid skills and not just punish them? Is what the 
what the school is doing going to move the dial forward? Or when, you know, let's say the kid just got suspended because he did whatever behavior. What's going to make it different next time? So my focus is going to want to be on, you know, let's get through this punishment. If we can't get around it, if we can get around it, of course, we're going to try that. But more than anything else, what led us to this point? What are we going to do to change this and build this kid's skills or build the teacher's skills in managing the child, add in whatever supports we need? Okay. Um, here's a tough one. Um, my son's kindergarten teacher approached me on the first day about my child not listening to her instructions. Um, she's contacted me every day since about how he's not following her instructions. Um, I've asked to uh, observe the class. I've met with her twice, and the only um, what I've gotten is a, she recorded a video of him in class instead. Is this common practice, and how should I pursue this? Sounds very tough. Ooh, boy, I'm uh, trying to calm myself down, and I can feel the know, anxiety and yeah. anger in that question, and I feel for you. Um, I'm not so sure that that is appropriate school policy, and I would mm -hmm. definitely want to know if that's appropriate school policy, but again, work through the teacher and say, hey, I'm really curious, because remember, your child may be in this classroom all year long, right? Um, and if that's going to be the case, you're going to want to be building relationship with this teacher. So you could say, hey, you know what, I'm, I just am unfamiliar with such a practice. Is this common practice? But more than that, I want to help that teacher get curious and not judgmental. When we are judging, we're not noticing. I want to wonder why. I wonder why he's not listening to or doing what you're asking him. Is he distracted? Did he hear you? Sometimes, and again, I'm making this up because I don't know this child's situation. Sometimes the teacher said three things and my kid's working memory is not strong enough to hold on to those things. Or the processing speed. Or he has a hard time, you know, paying attention. But guess what? We can't punish the disability. The disability says he has ADHD, he's going to have trouble focusing, right? So right. we need to figure out what we can do. What are some strategies? And if this is an experienced teacher, well, hmm, what have you done with other kids in these settings? What have you done when a kid doesn't pay attention? What are some tools you have? What are some training you've had? And I'd be happy to offer some of the suggestions and things I've learned, right? And again, I'm happy to work with with that in terms of putting together, what do you need to let this teacher know? Right. So curiosity, non-judgmental, find out the facts of the school policy, and before you go over the teacher's head, go with the teacher and say, hey, I wonder if we could get some more support in working this out. Okay. Um, here's an, here's a, a more of a parental problem. Janet, my, my nine-year-old rises to the occasion, changes his behavior, use coping skills, but only really with incentives. I'm concerned about that, but his psychologist feels that this really helps him. What do you, what do you think? Is this, you know, do we, we tend to increase um, what he earns for to increasingly large incentives? So, you know, we're, her, she as a parent is concerned about the way this is going on the incentive front. Yeah, well, I, I echo her concern. As I said before, I do not, in my parenting, I do not teach rewards and punishments. I do not teach incentive programs. There mm -hmm. are specific times when small, specific incentives can be helpful. But by and large, that's not how we're going to build skills. And I think the parent intuitively is recognizing that. I mean, I've got teen, parents of teenagers who, when they come to me, they say, what am I supposed to do, offer my kid a car? You know, $100 <laughs> if he takes out the garbage. I mean, I don't know where to go with this, right, if that's the mentality. But the other thing you have to realize is that with rewards and punishments, they're not developing that internal motivation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you're offered a reward for reading three books, why read a fourth book? There's no reason to. So right? you're, you're, so, you're on this parent's side. Maybe she, maybe a new psychologist would be in order. Um, yeah. It, um, it might be, but, but the other thing, wait, one thing I just want to say real quick. One of the things that we know about the neurobiology of ADHD is that the reward and motivation centers of the brain are less activated. I'm going to say that again. So if you're writing this down, I'll say this slowly. In ADHD, 
the reward and motivation centers of the brain are less active. That is why those reward and punishment programs are not going to hit unless the kid is intrinsically motivated. Right. right? Okay. Well, um, we are running out of time. I have a feeling that there's lots more we could say. Cindy, your answers are, you, you really understand what's happening for, for our folks. Um, but thank you so much for your time today. And I want to tell everyone that um, we are having a special session with Leslie Josel just on homework next week. So those of you who didn't, whose questions we didn't get to about how to turn homework in, how to all, all of the homework issues will be addressed by Leslie Josel, who's our organizing coach next week. So that's on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Uh, Cindy, thank you so much. And thanks to, to all of you for um, joining us today. The webinar audio will be up for replay on our site later today. And um, I hope you'll check in and listen to it again. There was a lot to, to take away. And Cindy, thanks always for, for your work. Everyone check out Cindy's website and her, um, her book, Ways for Parenting Kids with ADHD. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.